Welcome all. Um, I am Will Fenton, Director of Research and Public Programs at the Library Company of Philadelphia. Some of you, many of you have heard my spiel before, but I'm going to give it again because I do it every week. This is one of my few tethers in this world. The Library Company is an independent research library founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1731. Over the past 290 odd years, we've changed a little bit. We have um, wonderful academic programs in uh, all things print and visual culture of early Americana, business history and political economy, women's history, and of course, African American history. In this series, our Fireside Chat series, which is now just about on its one year anniversary, um, is sustained just about entirely by our former research fellows and sometimes our current research fellows as we're going to encounter tonight. Um, when I started this on April 16th of 2020, which feels like a hundred years ago and probably shows on my face, I anticipated that this was gonna be a monthly series. And thanks to the generosity of our learning community, I've been able to sustain it. And um, this has been really great for me and I hope you've enjoyed it with me. You will notice that this is a little different from your traditional Zoom experience. Your camera, your microphone, they're not enabled. That is by design. It is seven o'clock on a Thursday night. You don't need to be surveilled. So relax, prop up your feet, pour yourself a big old glass of wine and enjoy what I think will be a wonderful talk. But that being said, you can still participate. Um, there is a chat functionality and lots of folks like to throw me curveballs and put questions in the chat. You can do that but um, my eyes aren't so good, so I might miss them, but it's a great place to put resources to share with one another. There's also a Q&A thread. So if you cursor around at the bottom of your screen, you'll see two overlapping dialogue buttons. That's a great place to put your questions and we will do our best to get to all of your questions, though I always fail miserably at this, but we will do our best in the last 15 to 20 minutes of our hour. But with that, it's my pleasure to introduce a current research fellow as my old research fellowship, the Albert M. Greenfield Foundation Fellowship. Emily Gowan is a current fellow at the Library Company of Philadelphia and a PhD candidate at Boston University's Department of English. Essays adapted from her dissertation project are forthcoming in J19, the Journal of 19th Century Americanists and American Literature. Ooh, two top shelf journals right there. Her work has also been supported by fellowships from the American Antiquarian Society, the McNeil Center for Early American Studies, and she will be a 2021 to 22 fellow at the Boston University Center for the Humanities. She is also an affiliate at Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research. Welcome, Emily. Thank you so much, Will, um, and thank you all for being here tonight. I am so grateful to be part of this fireside chat series where so many people I admire have presented their work. Um, as Will mentioned, I've been a dissertation fellow at the LCP this year and have benefited so much from the generosity and ingenuity of the staff. There were so many moments in 2020 when I thought it would be impossible for me to do the work that I needed to do this year. Um, but thanks to the help of everyone at the library company, I've had a really productive year and I'm just so, so grateful for, for everything that they have done. I'm also lucky to be here in this series presenting this work at an earlier stage than is typical for the fireside chats. Um, I'm still a graduate student, as Will mentioned, in the throes of revising my dissertation, so I hope you'll all feel free to ask questions during the Q&A and really help me think through what the ne next phase of this project's life is going to be. Um, the project, and let me share my screen so you can all see. The project is, is currently titled On the Margins, Steady Sellers and the Problem of Inequality in 19th Century America. And it explores the relationship between the rise of the novel, the history of print, and the problem of social inequality in the 19th century United States. My use of the term steady sellers is a little bit particular. Often when this word comes up in book historical scholarship, it refers to religious texts that remain in print for long periods of time. Um, but in the case of my project, it refers to literary texts that though they emerged in different forms, genres, national traditions, and historical moments, remained in print throughout the 19th century and eventually came to be considered as ancestors or early examples of the novel. The four titles I trace in the dissertation 
are Miguel de Cervantes' Don Quixote, John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress, Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, and Samuel Richardson's Pamela. As my title suggests, I'm interested in reconstructing the circulation and reception histories of these texts among marginalized readers. Those disempowered along lines of race, gender, age, and economic status, but who, thanks to the expansion of print in the first half of the 19th century, had new kinds of access to and influence over the literary marketplace. I'm especially interested in how newcomers to the reading public interpreted these old world narratives and in what ways their responses to and appropriations of these stories shaped the formation of the 19th century's retrospective assembly of a novelistic genealogy. But these readers didn't typically encounter steady sellers in the material forms that most of us think of when we think of novels. Instead, they often encountered adaptations, abridgments, and excerpts of these works in chapbooks, tracts, and pamphlets, shrunken into pocket editions, squeezed into newspaper columns and almanacs, or rewritten as ballads or limericks. And you can see my enormous hand in many of these images um, signaling how tiny some of these books are. Some of these books were richly illustrated, others were stripped of their original paratextual apparatus, and some were packaged in commercial or educational series with extensive appendices full of advertisements for other books. Many readers would encounter any given story in multiple formats and iterations throughout their lives and bring to each successive encounter their existing and increasingly layered interpretive memories. When American readers encountered novelistic steady sellers in the antebellum print public sphere, this is to say, they encountered them as multiple, mutable, and enmeshed in a media landscape defined by the commingling and proliferation of material forms. As a result, I argue, some of the most important texts in literary history owe their canonicity and endurance in the U.S. literary imaginary to the material transformations they underwent in the 19th century print public sphere. In making this argument, I'm insisting, as many other scholars in the broader library company community have also done, that a book's format has real implications for how it's read. This is something many of you heard Jordan Stein talk about in an earlier fireside chat on his wonderful new book. And I'm here to join Stein in the good-natured takedown of Ian Watt's theory of the rise of the novel. But whereas Stein looks at the material similarities between the printing of early novels and the norms of Protestant publishing in the 18th century, I take up the question of what the 19th century explosion of cheap textual forms did to destabilize the material identity of the novel, thus situating it within what Meredith McGill has called American literature's culture of reprinting. I should say too that Lindsay DeKirchie and Derek Spires had a really great conversation about some of these issues um, in a wonderful roundtable the other night that Will also led and their work has also been extremely influential to me. I take up the question of these novels after lives in US print specifically because as I'll explain towards the end of the talk, they exert an outsized and relatively unacknowledged influence on many of the most important American writers of the 19th century, many of whom were acutely interested in what the expansion of literacy would do to the novel form. But before I get to the question of 19th century US literature, let me share a few illustrative examples of the kinds of material transformations I'm talking about with regard to the 17th and 18th century texts that would go on to become study sellers. In 1868, the Unitarian minister Edward Everett Hale published an essay in the Riverside Magazine for Young People, explaining how to tell the difference between one of the hocus Robinson Crusoe's and the true book. He wrote, all the boys who read the Riverside Magazine have read Robinson Crusoe. For my part, I read Robinson Crusoe through about once a year. And as I first read it when I was eight years old and I am well nigh 111, you can judge how much enjoyment I have had from it. I read, as I hope you do, in the full unabridged, undiluted original edition. If you've never read that, dear boys and girls, you can hardly judge of the real Robinson Crusoe. Hale in this essay, offers a stunningly concise encapsulation of both the popularity and endurance of Robinson Crusoe in America and the interpretive questions raised by its entry into mass print. And as Hale well knew, the idea of the true book would not have been as settled as he makes it seem. The earliest US edition of the full length text of Robinson Crusoe that scholars have been able to locate wasn't printed until 1820. All other US printed editions that were in circulation around that time and even most of those produced shortly thereafter were abridgments. This means that for most early American readers, 
Robinson Crusoe looked very different from how Defoe imagined it. Less like a novel in most cases than like a children's book. And I've got a few images here for you, some of which are drawn from the library company's collections and that show some of the ways that early American printers set out to shape the interpretive legacies of Robinson Crusoe and how some of his readers um, subverted, or, subverted or resisted their efforts. So to the left, you have the title spread of an edition printed by Hugh Gain in New York in 1774. And it's a little bit difficult to make it out in this image, but it specifies in the small text at the bottom that it's a children's abridgment. Number two is the title spread for an abridgment entitled Travels of Robinson Crusoe, printed by Isaiah Thomas in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1789. And this abridgment also identifies children as its intended audience, and you can see it's inscribed. Um, the third one is a very, this is a special one. This was brought to me, uh, brought to my attention by the librarians at the library company just a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's an inscription found in a, in a version of the new Robinson Crusoe for the youth of both sexes printed by John Babcock in Hartford, Connecticut in 1800. This was a very popular version translated from an adaptation written by the German ed educator jo Joachim Heinrich Kamp. And it told the story of Robinson Crusoe in a dialogue between a gentleman and his children and removed scenes in which Crusoe was dependent on the remnants of the British economy. Um, this revision of the book's economic stakes appears to have been largely lost on the, these readers. However, the inscription shows that two boys exchanged the work for the price of a small brass lock, which I just love. I think that's such wonderful evidence. Um, and then on the all the way to the right, there are two images of a copy of the Wonderful Life Abridgment held by the American Antiquarian Society that was printed by William Cole in Newtown, Pennsylvania in 1806. This one is also inscribed by its owner. It says Elizabeth Walker, her book, and has a handmade wrapper made of pink fabric that she sewed on to protect it. This copy is also typical of it, these wonderful life abridgments in that it's 30 pages and 11 centimeters tall. So it's very, very small and was very cheaply produced. I show this image because to my mind, it's a great example of how a reader transformed a small, cheap, ephemeral version of Robinson Crusoe into something that defies all of the easy assumptions we might make about the class, gendered, and material determinants of reading. The Pilgrim's Progress of the four books this project traces circulated the most like a religious study seller, in part because for a long time, that's what it was. It was first printed in America in 1681 and was one of the most consistently reprinted texts in colonial North America. Benjamin Franklin speculated that it was the second most read text behind the Bible. But the reason Franklin gives for this offers us a clue as to why Bunyan's text evolved over the course of the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries into one of the most oft-cited ancestors of the novel form. He attributed the work's popularity to the fact that, quote, Honest John mixes narration with dialogue, a method most engaging to the reader, end quote. Franklin read The Pilgrim's Progress, in other words, like a novel. Like Crusoe and Pamela, the novelistic narrative style attracted the attention of abridgers and resulted in the emergence of adaptations for children, many of which would get picked up by tract society publishers in the United States. These children's abridgments walk an interesting line between wanting to use Bunyan's lively style and well-known story to attract the attentions of young readers and disciplining the interpretive unruliness that novelistic style was imagined to provoke. Here's an example on the left um, is a copy of a poetic adaptation of the Pilgrim's Progress designed to correct unruly reading. Little, Little Marion's Pilgrimage was published by the American Sunday School Union and tells the story of a little girl whose unsupervised reading of Bunyan's book inspires her to embark on her own pilgrimage and run away from home. She gets lost in the countryside and ends up finding her way to a fancy manor where a group of kind ladies teach her proper interpretive habits. Um, and on the right is another version of this that's held at the American Antiquarian Society and it's shaped like a doll, which invites all kinds of other inter interpretive unrulinesses of its own. Um, and we can talk about that in the Q&A if people are interested in knowing more. Pamela was first printed in the United States by Benjamin Franklin in 1742, and scholars, librarians, and bibliographers often identify this text as the first novel printed in America. But American readers didn't start to really latch on to the story until the 1790s, when it was made widely available in a series of illustrated abridgments, which remained popular through the middle of the 19th century. 
there were two illustrated abridgments that though they originated in England, circulated more widely in the United States and were far more popular than reprints of Richardson's original text. These abridgments bear traces of a renegotiation of Richardson's legacy in American literary culture, a negotiation marked less by reconfigurations of plot, which were so common in abridgments of Robinson Crusoe, than by material and paratextual reframing, visual elements and shifts in narrative tone and perspective. Pamela, for those who have not read it, was famous for being an epistolary novel in which a young girl resists sexual abuse and bears first person witness to it through letter writing. But the story was transformed through abridgment into an omniscient third person narrative. Pamela's subversive use of reading and writing as a result are transformed from sources of power and agency into markers of vulnerability. Though Pamela was converted through abridgment into a tool for the acquisition of literacy, it was simultaneously stripped of its most radical interpretive suggestions about the destabilizing power of reading and writing. Of all the changes wrought through Pamela's abridgment, however, there is one for which American printers were chiefly responsible. The figure of Mr. B, thanks to the circulation of illustrated abridgments, slowly morphs from his early incarnations as a richly attired pale-skinned aristocrat into a shadow-cloaked figure with a darkened face. By the time these abridgments reached the United States in the late 18th century, there are certain images, particularly those designed to illustrate his predatory nature, in which Mr. B resembles a black man, a move that opens up a tacitly racialized reading of the text by anticipating later 19th century discourses that conflate white femininity with purity and black masculinity with dangerous hypersexuality. Don Quixote, though it was the earliest of the four works I trace, is also the last to appear in the United States. The first Don Quixote printed in North America arrived in 1803 and was a reprint of a, trans a translation by Tobias Smollett, originally published in London in 1755. 19th century US printers published reprints of several competing 18th century translations of Don Quixote, often accompanied by copies of engravings drawn from other translations. As a result, the marketplace was filled with versions of Don Quixote containing competing texts and illustrations and numerous permutations and combinations. Some emphasize the work's satirical commitments, usually through reprints or copies of illustrations by George Cruikshank, who also illustrated a number of Dickens's novels, and others reimagined Don Quixote as a romantic figure, exemplified by reprints and copies of illustrations by Tony Yahanot, who was, a who was famous for his illustrations of Goethe's works. This bifurcation in visual representations of Don Quixote had traceable consequences during the decades identified both as the American Renaissance and the Jacksonian era. Political cartoonists deployed images of Don Quixote tilting at windmills to critique policies ranging from what they saw as futile to outright violent. American authors, by contrast, reimagined Don Quixote as a misunderstood romantic, privileging the life of the mind over the concerns of the world. And here are some examples um, of a couple of the big trends in Quixote illustration in, in US printed translations. The far left shows the style of the Yahanot illustration imitations and in the middle is a copy of a Cruikshank illustration. And you can see there are pretty significant differences. And I'm, I apologize that the, the Cruikshank one is a bit blurry. Um, and on the far right is a political cartoon with 12 panels depicting various controversies of the Jackson Van Buren administration, which is, um, emulating also the style of the Cruikshank plates. The second goal of this project is to figure out how the uneven and contested print histories of these four study selling works influence the development of the 19th century American of 19th century American literature, particularly that which attempts to address and include issues and groups of people excluded from the literary imaginary of 17th and 18th century Europe. This means two things. One, that I'm imagining American writers as readers whose early encounters with these steady sellers can and should be situated within a print culture that rendered them unstable. And two, that by extension, when we see these texts invoked in 19th century US literature, that unstable print history should factor into how we read those moments of in influence and intertextuality. What this ends up looking like is that each of my four chapters pairs its extended bibliographic and book historical analyses with a long section proposing a new way of reading an important work of 19th century American literature. Chapter one, which begins by tracing the print history of Robinson Crusoe, ultimately argues that US abridgments of Crusoe are invested in deploying Defoe's story to teach young readers economic lessons, 
But what exactly those lessons ought to be differs from abridgment to abridgment. This becomes especially consequential when we consider that these abridgments circulated most often among poor and working class readers. The chapter closes with an extended reading of Herman Melville's Moby Dick, a novel about what happens when a diverse group of working class subjects attempts to translate these competing theories of labor and value into meaning and material gain. Chapter two pairs the print history of the Pilgrim's Progress with the development of the sentimental female buildings Roman, best exemplified by Susan Warner's The Wide Wide World. Warner, who spent some time as a volunteer for the New York Religious Tract Society handing out books to the poor, was conflicted about the place of novels in the moral education of American girls. Her story of Ellen Montgomery's Bunyan-esque spiritual pilgrimage, which is structured by encounters with both religious and literary steady sellers, seeks to redeem what 19th century critics of novel reading feared was happening between women and their books. Reading that though certainly grounded in the material and alert to the most overt themes of a given text was also intensive, emotional, and anchored in individual interpretation. For Warner, the problem was not bad readers, but bad books. By unleashing the emotional attitudes of sentimental reading onto good books, books that, like the steady sellers that appear in Ellen Montgomery's library, announce their appropriateness and respectability through traceable material evidence of their reception and circulation, Warner banishes the notion of the dangerous girl reader and imagines a world in which the didactic affordances of fiction, the moral authority of old world literature, and the practices of sentimental reading converge on a new kind of popular novel. Rather than forbidding novel reading, Warner invents an alternative genealogy for the American novel, one that relies upon a compensatory fantasy of steady seller's material and moral stability and understands sentimental fiction as both the inheritor and the guardian of the novel's legacy. Chapter three investigates the complicated relationship between canonical seduction narratives like Samuel Richardson's Pamela and Harriet Jacobs's incidents in the life of a slave girl. A narrative that as many critics have point out, pointed out, emulates some of the patterns of Richardson's novel. I build on this scholarship by arguing that Jacobs's appropriations of Richardsonian plot structures, characters, and paratexts mark her attunement not just to the influence of Richardson's original novel on American seduction plots, but also to the ways in which the literary marketplace had transformed it. To the extent that Jacobs's memoir looked like a novel, it did so under the recognition that the shapes and surfaces, as well as the thematic investments, target audiences, and social contexts in which novels circulated were increasingly mutable. Jacobs was also invested in reversing the trend, evident in the illustrated Pamela abridgments I showed earlier, of assuming that sexual violence and coercion happened exclusively to white women. American printers must have understood on some level what Jacobs would later make explicit. The racialized power dynamics upholding the US slave system rendered Pamela's moral logic incompatible with the face of domestic service in the households in which abridged editions might circulate. Rather than adapting Pamela to reflect these demographic differences, however, printers like Samuel Hall upended them, imagining white women as the ultimate victims of concubinage and rape. Whether or not Jacob saw Hall's abridgments or others like them, her investments in portraying Dr. Flint's cruelty as an outgrowth of the kinds of abuse represented in Pamela are certainly aimed at exposing the sexual abuse of enslaved Black women and the gendered prohibitions that keep its consequences so effectively repressed. Finally, chapter four argues that the instability of Don Quixote's afterlives in print and visual culture, as well as the resulting debates about the consequences of quixotic reading provided Mark Twain with an especially useful point of departure for the adventures of Huckleberry Finn, a novel that among other things reflects upon the, upon the confrontations between individual investments in old world narratives and the mass halluc hallucinations of white benevolence obscuring the racialized violence of the antebellum US South. Rather than banishing or correcting quixotic readings, Twain, just as Cervantes does, stages them. The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn not only rehearses the forms and plots made famous by writers like Cervantes, Bunyan, Shakespeare, and Defoe, it is also driven by its characters' misreadings, non-readings, and bad readings of these same texts. A pristine copy of The Pilgrim's Progress sits on the Grangerford family's parlor table, 
which Huck, after a cursory glance, concludes is, quote, about a man that left his family, it didn't say why. His reading of the history of General Washington and the wars, which is possibly a reference to Parson Weems's The Life of Washington, provokes abuse from his drunk father. And Tom Sawyer's encounters with the Arabian Nights Entertainment, Don Quixote, and the Count of Monte Cristo inspire a habit not just of reading adventure tales, but of acting them out, as Quixote himself would. Meanwhile, two con artists, known as the King and the Duke, roam the South, staging their Shakespearean revival. The literary culture Huck and his friends know is a swirl of 16th century drama, 17th century satire, 18th century translations, 19th century novels, histories, spiritual autobiographies, primers, and popular fiction. And without the supervision of educators or cultural tastemakers, the generic temporal and national and aesthetic boundaries between these forms of traditions vanish altogether. Melville, Warner, Jacobs, and Twain, each in their own way, pose the question at the center of this project. What is the relationship between the reception and circulation of steady sellers and the problem of inequality? And the answer differs for each. In devising the story of the Pequod, Melville set out to create a working class narrator whose inner life was shaped by the sorts of reading that occur in a world of super abundant and uneven print circulation. Moby Dick's narrator Ishmael, though he lacks formal education, reads widely, deeply, and quite promiscuously, and is just as attentive to the material features of the books he reads as he is interested in the knowledge they contain. The appearance of whale-like creatures on bookbinder seals, for instance, strikes him as just as noteworthy as the mythical and scientific theories of the Leviathan's origin. He accrues, accrues vast stores of knowledge in unsystematic and eccentric ways a fact which renders him as vulnerable to the intellectual tyranny of others, Ahab most notably, as he is uniquely capable of subverting it. He tosses out Linnaeus's taxonomy in favor of his own system of organizing whales, which notably takes the printed book as its analog for the sizes and variations of whales. He also seeks to corroborate ancient knowledge with personal anecdotes and mines technical writing for philosophical epiphanies, assembling a worldview and a value system entirely his own. Ishmael, moreover, is not the only member of the Pequot's crew we see learning to navigate the world of letters in idiosyncratic ways. Quiqueg counts rather than reading the pages of the Bible. We find Bildad spelling away at his book and Pip recites Murray's grammar in a fit of madness. Susan Warner is likewise interested in the materiality of steady sellers and the idiosyncratic reading practices they invite. But whereas Melville is interested in young working class men, Warner takes up the question of girl readers. Her protagonist, Ellen Montgomery, is initially drawn to books by their delicious smell and sumptuous surfaces. When her mother takes her to a store to pick out a Bible of her own, she, quote, pours in ecstasy over their varieties of type and binding, ignoring at first the substance of the text inside. The process through which she selects a Bible of modest size, bound in red leather, as durable as it is visually appealing, marks not only her induction into the culture of independent devotional reading, but also her ability to adhere to the norms of the bourgeois print public sphere. Later, she comes to prize her copy of Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress for similar reasons. It is, quote, a fine copy bound with beautiful cuts and inscribed with a letter from her handsome friend, John Humphreys. It also contains his careful annotations in the margins. Quote, simple, short, plain, exactly what was needed to open up the whole book to her and make it of the greatest possible use and pleasure. John Humphreys, like John Bunyan before him, attempts to guide Ellen's readings of the allegory with marginal notes and explications, which is something that Bunyan does in the original Pilgrim's Progress. But Ellen extracts far more pleasure and emotional significance from these notes than he can possibly have imagined she would. Rather than imposing a sort of interpretive superstructure, John's attempts at literary surveillance add further fuel to Ellen's intensifying romantic feelings. And such feelings, Warner insists, rather than impeding her understanding of Bunyan's book, turn Ellen into a more effective evangelical Protestant than any other character in the novel. Ellen shares the book with the illiterate rural laborers in her midst. Quote, with a throbbing heart, she shares the Pilgrim's Progress to the farmer, John, uh, Mr. Van Brunt, 
who is so taken with the story that he asks to hear the whole thing and begins to ponder adopting a Christian faith. Harriet Jacobs is more skeptical, skeptical about the circulation of steady sellers and the expansion of literacy than either Melville or Warner. She invokes Pamela, a novel that exists, insists upon the relationship between women's command of literacy and their ability to resist sexual violation in order to question assumptions about the, the way the emancipatory potential of literacy and the circulation of novels alike. Just as Jacobs is interested in complicating simplistic notions of fair skin as a marker of moral virtue, notions made explicit in illustrated abridgments of novels like Pamela, she also advances a simultaneous critique of literacy as a tool of self-liberation, something in which novels like Pamela and slave narratives like Frederick Douglass's are equally invested. Whereas Pamela's literacy is put forth in both Richardson's original as a source of agency and a marker of her virtue, and for Frederick Douglass, the ability to read and write is the key to his eventual self-emancipation and his evolution into an orator and polemicist. For Linda Brent, literacy is as much a li liability as it is an asset, and she learns to claim power not only by exercising her ability to read, but also through a refusal to do so. When Dr. Flint catches her teaching herself to write, she begins writing her, he begins writing her seductive letters and slipping them into her hand. A gesture intended to pervert her command of what Audre Lorde has termed the master's tools and further her subjection. As such, Jacobs's Linda comes to recognize her command of, of language as a source of potential danger, even as it is also a source of power. For Mark Twain, canonical novels can be by turns a mode of liberation and a snare. And the extent to which they fulfill either of these functions is largely determined by his character's gender, class positions, age, and race, all of which correspond with uneven access to alphabetic literacy and literary knowledge. Though women and girls appear in scenes of devotional domestic reading, all of Twain's characters whose reading wields currency outside the home are boys or men. The king and the duke, though poor, benefit from the power of adult male whiteness and can thus exploit the terrain of fictionality to move undetected across barriers of class and identity. Whether their readings or reenactments of fiction are accurate has no bearing on their power. The cultural context through which they move neither recognizes nor rewards interpretive fidelity. Tom Sawyer, though younger, is more securely ensconced in the protections of family and community. His readings, which are just as unorthodox as those per perpetrated by the King and the Duke, ripple out, shaping the actions and perceptions of other characters, often in disastrous ways. Huck responds to Tom's unscrupulous readings with skepticism, but he just as often proves a willing participant in Tom's fantasies. For characters who lack even Huck's provisional literary education, Tom's readings represent an uncontested and uncontestable standard of literary knowledge. As a result, those characters become eager deputies in the unfettered circulation and dangerous enactment of Tom's confused assemblage of steady sellers. And Jim, the person who is most fully excluded from both the advantages of literacy and the protections of white male identity bears the brunt of other characters' narrative distortions. Even as his own epistemological commitments are shown in quiet exchanges with Huck to wield demonstrably more moral clarity than those presented by the novel's brokers of literary power. As Swain explores the potential upsides of literary inclusion, he also exposes literacy and literary knowledge as inadequate to the task of, of leveling racial, class, and gender hierarchies. Indeed, in Twain's imaginary reanimation of the antebellum Mississippi Delta, the interpretive indeterminacy of steady sellers becomes yet another tool in the arsenal of white supremacy. Taken together, these four works engagements with steady sellers mark both a claiming of their own place in the evolving transatlantic literary genealogy and a recognition that that very genealogy remains in flux, open to the transformations, subversions, and perversions of a heterogeneous print public sphere. For Melville, Jacobs, Warner, and Twain, the democratization of literacy and literature affords certain opportunities for resistance, but the novel's mutability at the hands of printers, publishers, booksellers, and readers is not always a cause for optimism. The continued circulation and reception of canonical steady sellers dramatizes the problem posed by print's simultaneous fixity and elasticity, its ability to preserve as well as its capacities for constant renovation. 
The contested reprinting history of novelistic steady sellers in the 19th century United States reveals the limitations of both regenerative and conservative notions of print's epistemological functions. Limitations which, which all four authors recognized and theorized even as they submitted their own masterpieces to the juggernaut of 19th century print. Thank you, I will stop there. Wonderful, thank you so much. I'm trying to keep my uh, fireplace still in view while also not cutting off too much of my head. Um, for all of you in attendance, if you have a question, please do put it into the Q&A thread and I'll do my best to get to all of them. I'd like to kick us off with a sort of a, a, a quick sort of jargon related question, just in case we have some folks that aren't um, as acquainted with literary studies and our idiosyncratic ways. Um, you mentioned on several different occasions how important paratext or paratextual apparatus is. So can I ask you just to take a little bit of time to walk us through like what is or are paratexts and why are they so um, crucial to the understanding of a text? Thank you, Will, for the reminder that that, that is indeed um, inaccessible jargon. <laughs> Happens all the time to me, yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess the easiest way to, to answer this question is to demonstrate it on an actual book. Please so do. paratexts are the, the material um, and, introductory framing devices that publishers use to, to, to tell you what a book is. So the fact that this wonderful book by Jessica Marie Johnson has this book, this title page with nothing else on it, that's a, pair, a piece of paratext. Um, information about the publisher and the printer is a paratext. A paratext can also be illustrations. It can be the way that text is formatted on the page. So I've heard people talk about blank space as a paratext, which I think mm. is a really brilliant and interesting idea. Um, paratext can be footnotes. Paratext can be anything that's not the actual body of the text in question. Um, it can be chapter headings. And in the, case, in the case of the 19th century, what does and doesn't happen with paratext is so all over the place. Um, which is why I think I'm struggling a little bit to answer this question concisely, is there are so many different things that could fall into the category of a paratext. I also read um, like bindings as paratext. I think that, there, that that's an important, an important piece. It's, it's also a material culture thing, but the two I think can be thought together really usefully. Yeah, so that leads me to a question that I feel uniquely privileged to ask you as a you know a current fellow trying to conduct research advance a dissertation in the middle of a plague mm -hmm. um, how do you attend to all of the things that you would normally attend to in a in our reading room for example um, you know the materiality the sense of the size of the object when frankly you've got to do a lot of that work remotely it's really hard. That's <laughs> that's the most honest answer I can give you. But I, I just want to toss out a huge thank you to Connie King um, and Ainsley Eakins for, for being really innovative about how they have helped me to do this over the, the course of the last few months. Um, we've had iPads set up looking at things. Um, and the library company does a great job of uh, describing things like binding and format and size in catalog notes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the subs what I found is to be the best substitute for actually in person looking at the thing and, and seeing what's in there is asking questions of librarians saying, how big is this thing? Can you tell me a little bit more about what it looks like? Is it inscribed? Is it beat up? Does it look like lots of people have read it and loved it over the years? Um, and thankfully, folks at the library company have been incredibly generous about answering those questions for me. But I am very excited to have in-person research be a more regular part of my life again sometime soon. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I suspect you're not the only person to <laughs> feel that way. And one of the things that I thought was really wonderful about some of your early images, particularly when you're dealing with those sort of microscopic little books, is that you included your hands in there to give us a sense of proportion. You know, I mean, like if we were looking at the digital surrogate, I guess that's the fancy term for it, like the digital reproduction of that, we wouldn't necessarily know that there was anything different about that text 
you know, we uh, would have a nice high resolution scan of the image. So I guess I'm just curious to know, like, how are you thinking about the sort of size of those very small objects and the work that they're doing? I think size, size is really important because size tells us both about, um, you know, how expensive or cheap something was to produce. It's not as hard to make a small book as it is to make a big book. It takes less materials. It takes um, fewer pieces of paper. The exception to this is sometimes mini books and like teeny, teeny, tiny things were, were a way for printers to show off their skills to mm. look how tiny I can make this. Um, <laughs> but that's not usually what's happening with the examples that I'm showing. Um, and then the the small format also can tell us about the intended audience. It can it can suggest that this is a book for children who have tiny hands, and that this can can read these easily. Um, some of them that are not quite as tiny, but that are still small, sort of in this range, could be fit in a pocket, taken on a train, read in 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 transit somewhere, um, in casual sort of social settings. So I think that format and size are super important to, do, to attend to. And I think they are also among the most difficult things to attend to when you're just looking at a digitized version of something, especially if it's a digitized version of something on, on like Google Books or Happy Trust with where there's no, um, you don't have the detailed catalog records that librarians are so good about providing. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm certainly grateful to our, our reference staff who keep our catalog um, up to date and useful because I can't tell you how many times I've consulted our search engine Wolfpack and like I just find information I can't find elsewhere. It's really helpful for thinking critically about um, the context in which I'm reading the text. Um, so again, feel free to drop a question into the Q&A or you're, you're gonna be stuck with um, my sort of continuing uh, 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 questioning here of Emily. We just got one in from J.E. Morgan uh, who comments, great talk, Emily. I wondered if you might talk a little bit more about the following. When you, as a literary scholar, use the name Brent versus Jacobs, for example, what distinction are you making between the text as a literary work, a historical source, or are you? Um, think about the fixity and, and elasticity of these categories for us today, to, or sorry, thinking about the fixity and elasticity of these categories for us today to echo your language. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, thank you, um, J.E. That's, that's a really good question. And it's something that's preoccupied scholars of Jacobs for a long time. Um, incidents in the life of a slave girl had a really troubled reception history. It was dismissed as, as being a novel written by a white woman, partly because it was edited by Lydia Maria Child, who was really famous. Um, and so people just assumed that it was, it had been written by her. And for, and until late in the 20th century, that was the accepted scholarly opinion. Um, and so in recovering the, like the truth of incidents in the life of a slave girl, um, scholars have become much more rigorous about making that distinction between Harriet Jacobs and Linda Brent and making Harriet Jacobs's authorship really central to how, how they talk about that text. Um, but I, I think that thinking about Linda Brent less as a character and more as a pseudonym is helpful here. And I, I, I messed this up in the way that I presented the four um, 19th century works on my last slide. Mark Twain wrote with a pseudonym. So did Susan Warner. Her, her pseudonym was Elizabeth Wetherell. Mm -hmm. um, and and <laughs> Harriet Jacobs' pseudonym was Linda Brent. And so thinking about a pseudonym as a way of both protecting her identity, um, allowing her to write about these really sensitive things that happened to her, and also putting her in sort of winking conversation with the fictional terrain that she is drawing upon, but not entering fully. She's still, this is a memoir and it's important to remember that. Um, but I think the use of a pseudonym is part of that interesting gesture that she's making, signaling to her readers that like, you can use the habits of mind that you use when it, you approach fiction to approach this work. I want you to be invested. I want you to, mm -hmm. to take the drama of this seriously. I also want you to know it's true and this is really happening and, and there's bad stuff going on. 
Um, so I think the elasticity, the, the, the sort of tension between the elasticity and the fixity of Jacobs's identity and the way that she's using the, the pseudonym Linda Brent and the character Linda Brent are all part of how she's situating the work um, in this kind of liminal space between fiction and memoir. I hope that makes sense. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure we'll get a follow-up question if it doesn't. That's uh, the jewel of uh, Zoom <laughs> here. Uh, Lori Hetherington, uh, or Hetherington, excuse me, Lori, writes a fascinating and scholarly integration of diverse themes. I am interested in thinking in the thinking processes behind your putting these texts together. How and when did you begin to make these connections? Great question. Um, I think that that the credit goes to the way that I was um, trained <laughs> in my graduate program. Um, I was learning about theories of the rise of the novel at the same time that I was learning about um, book history and theories of print culture. And it clicked for me that these two issues were really, really intertwined um, and, is, and in especially interesting ways in the US literary marketplace. Um, I am a 19th century Americanist by training. And so that's the time period that I read for my comps. And that's those are the texts that I was looking at. Um, but I, again and again, as I was reading for my comps, kept seeing these titles, Don Quixote, Robinson Crusoe, Pamela, and uh, the Pilgrim's Progress pop up in 19th century novels. They kept coming up as, as these signifiers of literariness. Um, and I wanted to know why, and I wanted to know in what forms the authors of those 19th century novels were enca maybe encountering the 17th and 18th century texts. So I went looking in archives and I found that it was a way more interesting story than I had ever imagined. Um, and that the heterogeneity of these texts in the 19th century was just sort of mind boggling. Um, and, and here we are, <laughs> that's, that's how the dissertation was born. <laughs> All right, we have a, 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 a quick question here from Will Glover who writes, thanks for a great talk. Would font be considered as a paratext too or is it too enmeshed with the main body text that it falls under a different category? I don't know. <laughs> that's such a good question. I know, right? It's, it's a material component of the text that's worthy of consideration. Um, sure. I think that you can make a case that, font, I mean, font, font, I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to have to, to withhold my judgment on this question. I'm sure someone else has thought about this and has a smarter answer. Um, but regardless of whether you call it a paratext font is certainly something worth attending to when you're accounting for the materiality of any given text and, and describing. Yeah, so we'll, uh, we're counting on you to write that article. Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jordan Gowan writes, would love to circle back on the doll shaped version of Pilgrim's Progress that you reference. Could you unpack that a little bit? Um, thanks. This is my brother for the audience. Um, yeah, the, so the doll shaped version of Pilgrim's Progress and, and you might've also noticed on the first slide that I showed with a whole bunch of stuff that there was a doll shaped version of Robinson Crusoe as well. These toy books, um, shaped like paper dolls were not, you know, everywhere, but they were, you could find them. Um, and in the case of that Little Marian's pilgrimage text, I am especially fascinated by the fact that they chose to print it in the shape of a paper doll, because it's a cautionary tale about idiosyncratic um, attachments to books. And the they call in, in that poem, the narrator calls the Pilgrim's Progress Little Marian's pet book. And that's part of the problem. The fact that it's her pet book leads her to, to have all of these um, unacceptable <laughs> responses to the text and sends her out into the world where she gets lost and she gets in danger and she ultimately figures it out and, and ends up getting someone saves her and inducts her into sentimental womanhood and in, in all the right ways. Um, but the fact that someone would give a child a book that looks like a toy to teach them how to be a less unscrupulous reader is fascinating to me right. because we have that toy you can do anything with it. You can 
you know, dress it up. You can play with it with your little Robinson Crusoe toy book. It, it's not, it's not a um, serious and um, austere literary form. It's, it's a joyful one. And so I, I just, I find it totally fascinating um, and really a great example of how printers for, who were creating versions of these things for children were kind of caught between needing to figure out ways to appeal to those kids because they wanted them to read and being worried about um, what, what opening up mm. texts to, to unruly readers might do. Mm. All right, we've got a, a methodological question, my favorite kind from Matthew Brown, who thanks you for this presentation writes, um, you present a model of variation and instability for the four steady sellers, yet to move to a discussion of their, uh, of their influence on the four canonical writers, you presumably have to summarize about how the US reprintings affected Melville at all. How do you balance generalizing about the wide range of a specific edition, say a Bunyan variant from all the others, um, and, um, with, an aware, with an awareness of how that specific edition might have affected, say, Warner? Um, or do you choose an interesting variant edition without generalizing to discuss influence? Yeah, so this is, this is a, definitely a, a challenge of the method and something that I spend a lot of time thinking about. In some cases, it's easier than in other cases. Mm -hmm. um, so we know, for example, that Melville did encounter a children's edition of Robinson Crusoe on one of the whaling ships that he went on. Um, we also know that he grew up, he spent part of his childhood in Albany, where there was a huge profusion of children's, of uh, another version, another children's abridgment um, of Robinson Crusoe. So that data allows me to say it's very likely that that Melville encountered multiple versions of Robinson Crusoe in his life. And even, even if he didn't, he was enmeshed in a print culture in which that was a norm. Um, and being able to find those little archival nuggets of like, he really was on a whaling ship with this is, is nice. That's very helpful. In the case of Harriet Jacobs though, reconstructing her reading life is nearly impossible. We don't know what books she owned. We don't know what books were in the houses in which she was enslaved. We don't know what books, um, were in the houses in which she worked in the, in the North, other than that she worked for Nathaniel Parker Willis, who was a man of letters and had a lot of books, and he bragged about letting her read them. Um, we don't have the data about specific titles that she would have had access to. So in that case, it is more about, I am, I am having to generalize and make, make some leaps, um, which I think is okay to do. <laughs> I think that that's part of what literary studies allows us to do to sort of inhabit both, you know, on the one hand, more empirical, archivally motivated um, epistemological spaces, and then to also speculate a little bit, to do some, some um, reading in the gaps, right? Mm -hmm. So that we can try to imagine how someone like Harriet Jacobs comes to, arrives at, at the idea to use Pamela as a jumping off point for her really complex renegotiation of how sexuality and literacy and violence are intersecting in antebellum plantation slavery households. That's great. Kevin Murphy writes, great talk. Was the materiality of books associated with feminin femininity? Um, yeah, sometimes. And sometimes it was also associated with masculinity. If you had like a big giant book on your study desk, that was, you know, an easy way to, to say that you're a powerful, wealthy man. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, absolutely. The materiality of books, especially, I would say this comes up the most in the Warner chapter. Um, even in the Pilgrim's Progress, Christian, who's the protagonist, his wife, Christiana, has this very, um, sensory material attachment to a letter that she receives from heaven. And one of the arguments that I make in the chapter is that in making Ellen Montgomery's reading experiences so much about her material attachments to books, um, one of the things Warner wants to do is recuperate the material, the, the association between materiality and femininity in reading as an asset, as a good mm -hmm. thing. So to be engaged with the material surfaces of a book is not to be a bad reader, 
it is to be a feminine reader, but maybe that's a good thing in the case of, of um, the way that Ellen Montgomery is engaging with her books. That's great. All right. Um, I think we've got time for one more question here. Uh, Harold Klein writes, as you pointed out, the size of these, stud these, these steady sellers influence the price and quality of the band volume. Um, can you give us some idea as to the target markets of these volumes, demographically, socio socioeconomically? That is, how did literacy play a role, and if any, and where they were produced by the unit pricing size? So there's a ton of questions in that question. I'm going to tackle the ones that I can. Totally sure. um, so we know that some of these were supposed to be literacy tools because they include um, alphabets at the front of them. Um, so for example, we have that in a lot of the Robinson Crusoe's that I've looked at. Um, and I, there are also a number of examples of both Robinson Crusoe and the Pilgrim's Progress, and in some cases, Pamela too, where there are um, appendixes on the, in the back of the books that tell, that tell us they were part of school book series or, or other kind of literacy acquisition um, publication stables. And so absolutely part of what was happening was these books were being turned into the tools of literacy acquisition. Um, where they were produced and, and in what volumes that they're so, I could answer that in so many different ways, depending on which of these texts you're interested in knowing more about. Um, I do as a, and this is a generalization and there's tons of exceptions to it. I, I will say that a lot of the ones with literacy tools included in them emerged in rural and small rural towns, um, mm. like in Vermont, um, in villages in like Northern Pennsylvania, places where there was not a lot of other stuff happening um, with printing. Um, and my best guess as to what's going on there is that these were really easy for printers to get access to because nobody cared if you were reprinting any of these four titles um, and they could do it using whatever they had on hand. Um, and that was an easy way to create a literacy tool for for children or newly other newly literate people entering the print public sphere. Yeah, that's really interesting. Well, it's just about eight o'clock on a Thursday night. Uh, so I want to thank all of you for setting aside a little bit of your evening to join us. And I especially want to thank Emily Gowan for giving us the privilege of a sneak peek at what I think is going to be a really tremendous book project. And I certainly hope you will continue to consider the library company um, uh, a useful resource as you continue to work on it. Thank you so much, Will, and thanks everybody for coming. This was really wonderful. All right. Have a great night, everybody.